Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet on the video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751, which is also referred to as the Gotröra Miracle. You will hear a story about fantastic crew resource management, bravery, uh, unsung heroes, but also very surprising lacks of system knowledge and um, the errors that led up to this accident. So stay tuned. Wind 31016, Delta this video is brought to you together with Skillshare. Now, Skillshare is an online learning platform with thousands of high quality video courses and pretty much anything that you can imagine. I've gotten a lot of questions from you about, you know, how do you write the perfect CV? How do you apply for an airline job? And what should you think about in a cover letter? I did a quick search on Skillshare today and I found dozens of courses on exactly this. And one such course that I can recommend to you is The Ultimate Resume Hack by Yasir Khan. And it does pretty much exactly what it says it will. Now using Skillshare is really affordable. It's less than $10 per month. And if you are among the first 1000 users to use this link here below, you'll get two months of premium Skillshare absolutely for free. So you can go in, you can check out which classes you like. You can see if I'm lying to you, which I'm not. And if you find a class that you really, really like, send that to me because I love to continue learning. Alright guys, so this is the story of Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751. Um, the way that I've done this is like with all of the other videos in this uh, video series about accidents and incidents. I have researched the final report, I've read through the final report, and I've also tried to find other kind of inputs. And one of them that I've used is P3 Dokumentar. Uh, it's a Swedish radio program that did a documentary on this accident. I've linked to all of the sources down here. So if you want to read it for yourself, you can do that. Unfortunately, the documentary is in Swedish, but there might be some of you who can enjoy it. Anyway, let's go through it exactly the way that the fund report is written. So we'll have a look at the synopsis of the accident. You know, how did it happen? And then we'll have a look at what the accident investigation team came up with at the end, what kind of recommendations they had and what led to this accident in the first place. So SK Flight 751 um, was flown by uh, an MD-81. Now the MD-81 is a rather large passenger aircraft that is a, um, a prolongation and a bigger and a more modern version of the DC-9. Um, it has two tail mounted engines they have a t-tail um, and the tail mounted engines is going to become important very soon so this md81 had flown the day before uh, the accident happened on the 27th of december 1991 and on the 26th of december it came back from zurich at about 10 o'clock in the evening when it came back, it still had about two and a half tons of fuel in each wing tank. So it's quite a lot of fuel still there. And during the flight from Zurich, um, it had, there's been outside temperatures during the cruise phase of the flight of about minus 60 degrees Celsius. So the fuel inside of the tanks was extremely cold. During the night, there was uh, mixed weather, mixed with rain and uh, light snowfall, and a temperature between zero and plus one degree Celsius. So quite standard Swedish winter weather. Um, when the line engineers, technicians, uh, did the walk around in the morning, they noticed that there was quite a lot of slush that had accumulated on the top of the wings, and also that there was um, frost at the bottom of the wings. That frost on the bottom of the wings is something that I am very familiar with because we have exactly the same problem with the 737. Namely that if you have super cooled fuel in the wings, well in that case that will form frost. But that's okay. As long as that's within the, uh, the kind of defined limits, at least on the 737, it's not something that we have to worry about that much. However, if you have precipitation that's falling on top of that 
uh, super cooled fuel, then you have a different problem. So the engineers, they told the captain that was about to take over the flight, which was uh, Captain Stefan Rasmussen, together with his first officer, uh, Ulf Sedemark, that there was quite a lot of slush on the, uh, the wings, and the captain ordered the icing. The de-icing truck came, they used up about 850 liters of the icing fluid, which would be, you know, considered quite normal for a de-icing like that. During the startup sequence of the engines, the captain asked the, uh, the engineer whether or not the ice had been completely cleared for the wings, and the engineer who had been supervising the, the icing said affirmative, yes, it's, it's all gone now, it's all clean. He even, the captain even asked if the underside of the wings had been properly cleaned as well, and the, the icing crew had confirmed that that was the case. The aircraft taxied out, perfectly normal. It stated that the captain taxied a bit slower than normal, which is to be expected when you have wind drops outside. And they took off from runway 08 in uh, Stockholm, Arlanda. The flag was supposed to fly from Arlanda down to Copenhagen and then from Copenhagen on to um, Warsaw. And um, for the first part of the takeoff roll and rotation, everything was normal. But then about 25 seconds into the flight, uh, they started hearing this really weird kind of humming noise like that the, the flight crew hadn't heard before. That was then quickly followed by something that sounded like uh, a cannon blast. And several of them were coming in very quick succession. So there was boom, 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 like that. For each one of these bangs, the aircraft jolted kind of backwards and forward, um, just like it suddenly decelerated. For each boom, the aircraft decelerated a little bit and then jolted forward. So there was quite a lot of vibrations coming on. And the captain, Captain Rasmussen, who was pilot flying, he, he didn't really know what to make of it. He was looking over at the first officer, kind of asking, what's, what's that? Now, to be, to be fair here, the captain had not been trained on this particular problem in the simulator. Okay? What they were experiencing is something called compressor stall. Now, if you followed my channel, you know what I'm talking about. I've done a separate episode about what compressor stalls is. But the captain had not experienced it before, nor had he had been trained on it in the simulator. The first officer, Ulf Sedemark, he knew what this was, or he recognized it, because he had been flying the Viggen in the Swedish Air Force before he started flying for SAS. And the Viggen is actually fitted with almost exactly the same type of engine as the MD-81 has, um, with an afterburner, obviously. So he knew that with that engine, if, if you took out too much G's with the Viggen, you could cause the engine to stall. And when the engine stalled, that was exactly the sound it was making, and that was the kind of feeling you got from it. Okay. Just quickly, if you haven't seen my engine, uh, my uh, compressor stall episode, basically what a compressor stall is, is that something happens to the compressor stage of the jet engine. The compressor stage is supposed to push air backwards and compress it before it enters into the burn chamber. And if something happens in the compressor stage um, and it cannot do that, it, it's, it can stall the, the like individual little propeller blades inside the compressor. And when that happens, it stops pushing the air backwards. Instead, pressure builds up on that stage and it pushes the air forward instead. This is why they were feeling those kind of jolts, because for each time that this pressure built up and then released forward, you get that bang and you get that feeling of sudden deceleration. So this is what was happening. Um, now, the way that we deal with compressor stalls now, the kind of memory items that we have, is that you have to disconnect the auto throttle and you have to move the thrust on the side that this is happening backwards. You can pull the thrust back until it stops surging. The reason you're doing this is because since you're now taking less fuel into the burn chamber, you're basically taking away pressure on the compressor stage. So hopefully that will just, you know, make the, the individual stages stop stalling and the engine can go back to operating the way it was designed to do. However, if you have had some kind of foreign damage to the compressor, so if something has been ingested, bird, 
ice or whatever it might be, well then there might be a mechanical fault on the compressor stage and it might not help. But the captain did the correct thing here. The captain started reducing thrust on the right hand engine, which is where they had identified that they had the problems. It was also stated that the, the uh, captain found it very difficult to read the, the smaller digital gauges that they had on the new MD81 as compared to the, uh, the old DC9. Anyway, as he reduced the thrust on the right side, what he didn't notice was just after that thrust was reduced, suddenly the thrust came back on again. And actually, not only that, it actually increased the thrust, right? Because of everything that was going on, the pandemonium that was happening, um, none of the pilots actually noticed that this happened. But this is going to provide a crucial clue to one of the findings of the investigation later on. So anyway, unbeknown to the crew, the left-hand engine had also started surging at this place. The fact that they didn't notice this was probably due to the, the just sheer amount of warnings and vibrations that was there already. So the right engine was searching, the left engine was searching. And now, if you don't do anything about these compressor stalls, if you let them continue, these continuous buildup of pressure and these kind of constant searches is going to put the engine under so much pressure that it, it will eventually fail, it will eventually kind of disintegrate. So as these compressor stalls was now happening on both sides um, and the thrust had increased back again, it only took a few seconds for both engines to fail. First the right engine failed, followed by the left engine. Um, this is not good, all right? In the back, on seat two, Charlie, there was a, another pilot flying on this flight. His name is uh, Per Holmberg. Um, he was also a pilot on the MD-81 and he had done uh, transition training onto the MD-81 from the DC-9 earlier on. Now, Per Holmberg, when he did his type rating, he had reacted to the fact that in the DC-9, there is a checklist if you lose thrust on both engines. Not only does the checklist tell the pilot how to try to regain uh, one of the engines back in order to get some thrust back again, but also it would give um, kind of a, a, a plan for how to deal with flying the aircraft without engines and potentially then you know, putting it down hopefully on a runway somewhere. When he did the type rating on the MD-81, he reacted to the fact that that checklist had been removed. It didn't exist anymore. Because he thought, you know, these newer, more modern, uh, more effective engines was also much more susceptible to foreign damage, right? They were much more kind of delicate. So he had actually sat down at home and he had concocted his own checklist. In case I have dual engine failure on the MD-81, these are the steps I'm gonna take based on the old DC-9 procedures. Now, Pad was sitting back, and this was back in 1991, which meant that the cockpit door was not locked. In fact, a lot of pilots actually enjoyed having the cockpit door open so that the passengers could see what was going on in the cockpit. And this was the case on this day. So he was looking in, and he realized he heard both engines surging. He was also an ex-fighter pilot, so he recognized all of the signs as well. And he looked into the cockpit and he realized that there was not much going on inside of the cockpit. So Captain Rasmussen, who was at the controls, he was flying, but he was not giving much kind of um, advice or he wasn't calling for much from the first officer. He looked quite lost. The first officer was dealing with trying to, to find the correct checklist, but both of them were fairly new on type. Uh, so Per decided that he wanted to help. So he rushed forward, he was in uniform, he rushed into the cockpit and asked if he could help with something. Um, they, the pilots were really happy about this because uh, First Officer Ulf, for example, he now felt that he could kind of take some of the responsibility for reading the checklist and put that over to the more experienced um, captain that was now coming in and he can concentrate on talking to air traffic control and actually actions, actioning the checklist items that that pad was calling out. The captain 
he was concentrating on just flying the aircraft. He was still not 100% sure what was going on. You could completely understand that. Remember that they're now flying an aircraft that hasn't got any engine working, loads of different warning lights coming on. Uh, it's eerily silent all of a sudden after that initial cacophony that they would have um, had before. So when Pad came into the cockpit, he basically turned to the captain and just said, look straight ahead. Fly the aircraft, look straight ahead. If you listen to or you look at the, um, the cockpit voice recorder transcript from this crash, you'll see him saying that over and over again. Look forward, look straight ahead. And that's because he did not want the pilot flying to start dealing with something inside of the aircraft when he clearly needed to fly this stricken bird and to keep it from stalling. So the captain asked the now assisting captain Per to start the, um, the APU, uh, which he did. He also told him to tell the cabin crew to uh, prepare for an on-ground emergency. Right? So there was no PA done, there was no real communication done from the cabin crew to the uh, flight crew or vice versa, but they could now communicate just through the door, which was open. So the aircraft reached its highest altitude of 3,206 feet, just after both engines had failed, and it now started its inevitable glide down towards the ground again. Um, this is the first point of which um, the first officer could call air traffic control. And he didn't call a mayday call, but he called out that they had engine problems, that they wanted to return back to Orlando, uh, and also later on that he did not have any engines and probably couldn't return to Orlando. During this, you have to remember that these guys are in cloud. Okay? This is not like in the Miracle of the Hudson where he was in, vertical, uh, in visible conditions and he could see what was going on around them. No, these guys were completely immersed in cloud and the cloud base was about 1,000 feet. They were 3,000 feet now. So they made a slight left turn on from a heading of 080, which is the departure heading, to about a nodally course. Now descending slowly, and the cabin crew, who's heard what was going on, who's seen the, the uh, assisting captain running into the, uh, to the cockpit, heard that they needed to, um, to prepare for an on-ground emergency. So what they did here, and I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed when I see this, they, they started making PAs. Right? They understood the severity of the problem and in a very, very short time they made a PA both in English and in Swedish about how people needed to prepare. They started to instruct people on how to do the brace position in a very clear and concise way, which is heads down, grab ankles, which is basically just getting people down into a kind of brace position like this. Um, so they were doing this. Pat Holmberg is still inside of the cockpit. When they had descended down to about a thousand feet, they now broke out of clouds and they could for the first time see where they could potentially put this aircraft down. They found a, a large field, but the captain, Garasmussen, decided that that's too far, we're not going to reach it. So he settled on a smaller field, basically just straight ahead of the aircraft. It just needed a slight right hand turn to line up. As he was flying the aircraft now, the speed was bleeding off as the altitude was bleeding off as well. Per Holmberg saw this happening and he had his little checklist that he's made in his head. So as the speed was decreasing, he now started without any input giving flaps, right? Okay, but this is really important because if you are to have any chance of survival um, in a situation like this, you wanna make sure that when you do crash into a non-runway kind of uh, environment to have as low speed as possible. So the fact that he was now helping to take out flaps as the speed decreased helped the aircraft from stalling and enabled the aircraft to slow down but in a controlled way. The captain very, you know, was still concentrating on flying the aircraft and realized, oh, I, I don't have flaps. So he looked over and he said, uh, uh, flaps? And Pat Holmberg said, yeah, I'm giving you final flaps now. Meanwhile, the first officer, still talking to our traffic control, just looked over his shoulder and said, should we take the gear? What should we do with the gear? Captain did not respond. Per Holmberg, the assistant captain, did respond and said, yes, take the gear down. And just prior to the aircraft hitting the treetops, 
the gear was down and locked. Now, as this was happening, as we're now getting really, really close to actually crashing into the first trees, the uh, cabin crew called out to Pat Hornberg to get out of there, go sit down. So he jumped out of the cockpit and just threw himself down on the floor behind a galley wall. So he did not have the seatbelt on when the aircraft hit the trees. Okay. The last thing that's heard from SK Flight 751 is the radio call from a very surprisingly cool first officer saying, um, Orlando Tower, SK 751, uh, we're now crashing into the ground, but in Swedish. The aircraft at this point was at about 121 knots, which is still a high speed, but it is about normal approach speed. Okay. The gear is down and locked, which would provide a little bit of, of um, kind of taking up some of the forces. The first thing that hits the treetops is the right hand wing. The right hand wing gets completely torn off. As that happens, the aircraft starts a, a slow roll towards the right and it hits the other wing. The other wing also hits and part of it is being struck off. And then the aircraft hits the ground with the tail first on that little field that they were aiming for. It slides for about 110 meters and it breaks into three different pieces. After this, it's silent. Until all 129 passengers and crew manage to get out of this aircraft alive. This is why this is referred to as the Gotrara miracle. It happened just two days after Christmas. And even though this MD-80 had lost both of his engines within about a minute and a half from them leaving the runway in Orlando and then crashing down through the forest and into this field, every single one survived. There were some minor injuries and there was one severe injury, a woman that, that, uh, that severely hurt her back. Uh, but apart from that, everyone survived. Per Holmberg, he, uh, he, he was, you know, basically unconscious because he wasn't strapped in. Uh, but the, um, the captain, Captain Rasmussen, pulled him out of the wreckage. Most of the, of the passengers actually got out through the breakage points in the, um, in the aircraft. Because most of the emergency exits were actually blocked um, because of the impact. And... What they did was basically, they a, a few of the passengers went to the closest house, which turned out to be a little cabin uh, at the edge of this uh, of this clearing. They knocked on the, uh, the door and woke up a couple of teenagers who had been sleeping there. Remember, this is in the morning. Um, and when the teenagers opens the door, outside they see look, 125 people and a completely torn up aircraft, basically on their backyard. So the passengers are calling rescue operations telling them that you know we are here we've survived we're standing on this field and about half an hour later the first helicopters and the first uh, firefighting equipment arrives at the scene they cover everything on um, with with foam remember that the aircraft was fully fueled and it's full of of jet fuel everywhere now over the forest where they hit the trees and the right wing was broken off but also close to where the actual uh, body of the aircraft is lying they help a few passengers out who were stuck but unharmed um and that's basically it um it it was incredible that no one died in this um accident absolutely incredible okay so after um when when the air crash investigation team came in and started looking into this they had a few questions um first of all how come that these engines failed in the first place and they very very quickly honed in on the fact that there must have been clear ice formed over the wing roots and given the fact that the engines are placed where they are basically straight behind the wing roots, um, clear ice would have broken off as the uh, wings started flexing when they started, you know, taking out lift for taking off, broken off and gone straight into the engines. And in this case, actually hit both engines and severely damaged them. So that would indicate why the engines were damaged. But they still didn't understand how come A, the pilots 
couldn't identify, or the captain couldn't identify this failure, the uh, compressor stalls earlier and how to deal with it. Uh, and also, how come the thrust was taken off and then immediately came back on again? And here's where it starts to become really interesting. It turns out during the investigation that the flight crews had not been trained on this particular failure, as in compressor stalls was not part of the, the type rating or the recurrent training. So when uh, Captain Rasmussen was flying and he got these kind of lurches and these kind of bangs that he was hearing, he didn't naturally understand what it was, nor were there any memory items associated with it on the MD-80 at the time. So that's why he was so stunned and didn't understand what was going on. All of his capacity went into trying to, to, to understand what was going on with this aircraft and it didn't make any kind of sense. However, First Officer Ulf Sedemark, which had the previous experience of flying in the, in the um, Viggen, he could decipher it, but it wasn't because of the training. So there was a fundamental lack of training here. When it came to the fact that the thrust came back on the engines, uh, the investigation team noticed a system called ATR, which stands for Automatic Thrust Restoration. Okay? This system, Scandinavian Airlines systems, SAS, did not know existed on the MD-81. Turns out that this is a system that was primarily used under the FAA rules in America where there was noise abatement procedure, so the MD-80 would take off uh, normally and then they would reduce the thrust in order to, to, to you know, keep as quiet as possible as they were flying over uh, habitated areas and then they would add thrust and continue to climb. This system was built in so that if during that kind of low thrust segment an engine would fail, well, then this system would jump in, it would engage the outer throttle system, and it would add thrust. And since the outer throttle could not just handle one individual thrust lever, it would add thrust on both um, thrust levers up to go around thrust. All right? And this is actually what happened. So, as Captain Rasmussen very correctly reduced thrust on the, on the engine that was searching, and then let it go there, anticipating that it would stay where it was supposed to be. The Autotrust jumped in, found that the criteria for engaging ATR was there, added on thrust not only on the engine that was searching, but also on the other engine, which was also critically damaged, even though they didn't know it at the time. And this likely led to a quicker disruption of the engines, right? It is unclear because we don't know exactly the amount of damage that they had prior to this. It's pos perfectly possible that the engines would have um, failed anyway because of the ingested ice and the damage it's done inside the components of the engine. But one thing for sure that adding thrust during compressor stalls definitely doesn't help. And the uh, investigation team found it incredible that SES was not aware that this system existed on their aircraft nor had the pilots been told about it. The pilots did not know that this system existed. It was there in the manuals, right? If you went in and you read the, uh, the, the aircraft manufacturer's actual core manual of the MD-81, it was described there, but it had then not been transferred over to the, to the internal manual. So that was also a finding of the uh, investigation team that Obviously, these kind of systems needs to be not only included in manuals, but also trained. And there has to be some kind of way for the crew in a situation like this to disengage the system so that it doesn't act against the will of the, uh, of the pilots. Okay. So the investigation came with 15 different points, uh, recommendations for increasing safety. The way that these points are kind of made is that they're general. Like these points should be made. Um, it included things like, for example, being more careful and having a system enforced to make sure that you are really clear of clear eyes before you dispatch an aircraft. Both the flight crew and the de-icing crew and the airline needs to have a system enforced, quality of system enforced, to make sure that that is the case. And then several uh, points due to, to pilot training and um, system knowledge like this. What I want to say from my point of view, though, when I see this, is that there's a couple of things that really makes my heart warm. Um, 
first of all, it's something that we very often talk about here on the Mentor Pilot channel, which is the importance when something like this happens to divide roles. So that the pilot flying concentrates on flying the aircraft, the pilot monitoring concentrates on you know, dealing with the problem, uh, which is what happened here. Even though Captain Rasmussen didn't understand fully what was going on, nor did he give any real clear commands to his first officer, they still worked quite well independently and he continued to fly the aircraft. The aircraft never stalled, nor did he you know, move attention away from the, uh, the, the, his core duty, which was flying the aircraft. And on top of that, you have the initiative of Per Holmberg, who risked his life by running into the, to the cockpit and starting to take on roles and, and applying his own system knowledge and his own situational you know, technical situation awareness that he had attained by his own initiative of building that checklist and having that checklist in his head. So together these three showed really good synergy and they managed to, in a kind of quirky way, work this situation into the best of possible outcomes in this situation. Right? I love seeing how people work together and how one plus one plus one is more than three in this case. On top of that, I want to send a huge victory lap to the cabin crew. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a show of huge professionalism and knowledge and courage, the way that they handle this, um, without getting any clear instructions from, from, the, uh, from the flight crew, taking the initiative to, to start, you know, to give the PAs to, to initiate the, uh, the call for, for um, brace position. Normally in a situation where we are about to land off field, the pilots will give instruction to brace, brace, brace uh, about 30 seconds prior to, to, um, to impact. That didn't happen. The cabin crew took that initiative and did it as well. And it's likely that their quick comprehension of what was going on, their absolute professionalism in how they de dealt with information to the passengers and how they got them into brace position, um, was one of many reasons that this ended up in a so, within brackets, positive way as it did. That's it, guys. That's what I had. I thought that this was a really interesting uh, final report to read through. I highly recommend you to you know, start reading through final report. They're really, really interesting read. And um, if you have questions about this, you want to talk about it more, then put in the questions in the comments below. I hope that I have earned a subscription for you. If you like this kind of content that I'm doing, then subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up and highlight the little notification bell so you know when I'm doing live streams or spontaneous videos or whatever it might be. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. And the last thing I want to say is consider uh, to, to support my sponsor, which is Skillshare in this case. You can support me by supporting them. So use the link here below and the first thousand of you guys that uses this link will get two months of free Skillshare so you can check out all of the awesome courses in there. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.